So it's pretty clear that the NSA forced this process into choosing as the default a curve that is deliberately weakened. That does not mean that the approach of elliptic curve encryption is bad. It means that this particular default curve is bad. You can still use elliptic curve, and in fact, I think we should be looking at it. It is faster and more efficient than the alternatives. So it really does make sense. I think this is going to be the future of this um, algorithm. Now, symmetric versus asymmetric. Symmetric is fast and efficient, but needs no entropy. But it has key exchange problems. Asymmetric is resource intensive, requires randomness, but it solves the key exchange problem. Well, what can we do with that? Let's encrypt the symmetric key. <laughs> So, if you're using, uh, take a simple, you know, you're encrypting an email. You know, you got PGP set up or GPG, whatever you like to use. They're functionally equivalent. Uh, and so I'm going to encrypt my email. What is it doing? It is generating a symmetric <coughs> key that then encrypts the email. And then uses the asymmetric key to encrypt the symmetric key. And so remember the way that works is that there are two keys in asymmetric, designated public and private. So if I want to communicate with my friend Tom over there, all I need to do is say, Tom, here's my public key. In fact, I, I'm going to give it to Tom, I'll give it to Gib, I'll give it to everybody. I've got it published on my website. You know. Similarly, if, uh, if I'm dealing with Tom, I say, Tom, tell me what your public key is, because I may not want to send you something. So Tom gives me his public key. So I want to send a message. I, I grab his public key, create the message, it's encrypted using a symmetric key. And then that symmetric key is encrypted using Tom's public key, and I can send it to him. And then Tom says, oh, I'll use my super secret private key that nobody knows about that will decrypt all of this. But once he's decrypted the key, everything else happens using the symmetric key. So it's much more efficient that way. Right. Now, one of the things that's wonderful about this is that we use the same technology over and over. Right. So you want to take a look at SSL certificates. I've got a presentation on that. Maybe I'll offer that next year. It's basically doing the same thing. Only now what you're doing is you're trying to create a connection between your computer and a server out on the internet. You want a secure encrypted connection. So what happens? Uh, well, the server has a public key. And it offers you that public key. And then you can use that to create a secure connection through which they can then send you a symmetric key. And then they use the symmetric key for the rest of the session. So that's how that works. Take a look at SSH tunnels. Same thing. You use the asymmetric public-private <coughs> key pair to establish a connection through which you can then send a symmetric key. And then you use the symmetric key for the balance of your session because that's so much more efficient. So once you learn the, the fundamentals of this stuff, it applies everywhere. Right? And oh, OK, I guess 
I didn't have to worry about whether I'd run out of time. <laughs> Questions? I saw a slide about email. Can you go back to the CEO one more time? Sure. That happened to do that. Um, what was the name of that? Uh, I, I don't remember the name of it offhand. Um, probably if you went to the NIST website, you would probably get a reference to it. It was, it was, it was just within, you know, last six months. Are you interested in a deep dive technically into the mathematics of how to construct ciphers? Yeah. Okay. I mean, you could, there are textbooks on cryptography. Um, Bruce Schneier has written one of them. Um, His book is a little bit out of date. Yeah. Understanding cryptography is a good book. Understanding cryptography? Yeah, I forgot the name of Yeah. Yeah, there's actually a, a book of Bruce's that I like a lot more, and it's not the technical one. It's a book that he wrote called Beyond <coughs> Fear, uh, and I like it, Beyond Fear. And he wrote this in, like, 2003, partly as a response to 2001, 9-11, and basically saying, you know, everyone's running around like crazy doing things that are stupid. Um, and so he lays out a way of thinking about this stuff that I think is very good, where you start with, what's the threat you're trying to guard against? You start with that. Define the threat you care about. Um, and then, based on that, does your countermeasure actually address that threat? Yeah. So, for instance, I apply that I did a presentation recently on uh, LastPass and why the LastPass hack was nothing that concerned me particularly, because um, they had actually done a pretty good job of uh, doing security on their end. But I started, from the starting point is, if I use a password manager like LastPass, what is the threat I'm guarding against? And the threat I'm guarding against is someone like, Cracking the Office of Personnel Management and getting 35 million logins. That's the kind of thing I'm worried about. And it's like, well, you know, I'm worried about the NSA. And it's like, okay, if the NSA has targeted you, you have a different problem. <laughs> and in, in that case, I would say study Edward Snowden the way a rabbi studies scripture. <laughs> he so far has not screwed up. Except his Twitter account. <laughs> Everyone gets one. <laughs> Tom? Um, just accounting, because you said like modular mathematics yeah. and uh, like the Diffie Helmet. <coughs> There's a YouTube channel called The Art of the Problem. That's the title of the channel. Uh, it's by Britt Cruz, who's a Khan Academy contributor and content producer. Absolutely the most hands down simplistic explanations for cryptography, mm -hmm. how the key exchanges happen, all in plain English. And he still produces videos for Khan Academy, but his entire uh, series of mathematics videos, which are all free on YouTube, uh -huh. are 
I didn't understand a mod as well from reading it versus when I watched his YouTube videos. I'm like, ah, it makes sense now. Uh -huh. So I sat down and gone through all of them. They're really, really well done to give you a clear understanding of how the key exchange works, how perfect forward secrecy works, and some of the basis of mathematics that go into this. It gives you a lot of detail, but it's amazing in 15 minutes he, he'll have you understanding Diffie Holding Key Exchange Wonderful. with a few paint colors. Uh -huh. it's, it's really well presented, really well animated. Everything. The art of the problem. The art, the art of the problem is the name of the YouTube channel. Unfortunately, he doesn't update the YouTube channel. All this stuff is not published at Khan Academy, but it's still there. Uh, he's an interesting guy. If you want to read it, about him. He's a B R I T Brit Cruz. If you Google his name, it'll come up. Brit Cruz Khan Academy, and you can read, talk about some of the stuff he's working on. He's got a Kickstarter to uh, create a whole other video series for more uh, explaining cryptography, so people can understand it. Mm -hmm. Could could you repeat the address of your website? Z as in zebra, W, I, L, N as in Nancy, I, K. Dot com? Dot com. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I own the domain. <coughs> so since a lot of the problems are like sysadmins making a mistake, is there like a sort of kind of like a pilot's checklist of, you know, creating the key properly, how to secure it properly type reference? while they're professional, what? they should do a checklist every time to make sure they're not dropping any stitches. No. Uh, I haven't thought about that. That would be interesting. <laughs> what are the odds that proving the Riemann hypothesis would end some of these cryptography techniques, particularly uh, RSA? I, I didn't quite catch all of that. What was the... If somebody were to prove the Riemann hypothesis, ah. what effect would that likely have on some of these encryption techniques? I have the faintest idea. <laughs> um, I, I would, my guess is that, as with quantum cryptography, if it can be used to break a code, it can be used to create one. I mean, so so far, it, you know, if you just treat it as an arms race, that has worked to understand all of this. I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, do you have any comments or care to share on all the recent data breaches? Like it seems like every time, you know, yeah. on the news, there's been a, another massive data breach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> until heads start rolling, it will continue. Mm -hmm. You know? Well, you know, it, it, if, if you start seeing uh, CIOs doing the perp walk on their way to a federal penitentiary, CIOs will suddenly start taking this stuff seriously. I mean, the, the problem is, well, not just CIOs, CEOs. The, the, the problem is doing, it, it costs money, it costs effort takes resources to do proper security. We've got a pretty good idea how to do it. It's just getting the people who control the purse strings to say, yeah, this is worth doing. All right, I've, right now, uh, as far as I can tell, no point of sale terminal in the world is remotely safe. <laughs> it seems like every week I'm seeing another point of sale the problem. I mean, it was just this past week. It was all the Hilton hotel properties. You know, if if you went to a restaurant at the Hilton hotels, your credit card may be bad. On on that point, I've heard there's supposed to be a new standard for point of sale stuff, where the most cards are you're required to have a, a chip. Uh, it's actually as of uh, Thursday. That's yeah. supposed to be the case. And, and it, it'll just have establish a, a one-time use token. That will encrypt the right. transaction, so no, no company will ever fully store your mm -hmm. your information. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How many people have seen all of their credit cards convert over to chip? Oh, well, there's a few. I, I checked my wallet the other day. None of mine. <laughs> Sir, how does that work online? That chip and pin. You would still have to get. That's them a problem. Out. And so if you take a look at Europe where they've had chip and pin for a while, what it does is it cuts down on the fraud at point of sale. 
that does not cut down on fraud issues online. Well, no, I don't think we're actually too prepared. Sir. Yeah, check and this is talking about new standards and encryption and going forward. There's been a lot of uh, talk, of course, from our favorite three-letter agencies here in the U.S. about them mandating the use of backdoors into right. encryption routines. And where do you see that going? For a U.S. trade company? Not well. <laughs> um, we're just one 9-11 away from throwing away any roadblocks in the way of those three-letter agencies. Because as soon as there's an incident, it's like, oh my god, do whatever you have to do. So, yeah, um, I, I, don't see, I don't see that long run being very effective. So, and that's why I think what we can do is we take control of that when we do our own encryption. Because if I have chosen a good, strong encryption method and I'm communicating with Tom, who is smart enough to have a good, strong encryption method, I know I can communicate securely. And the NSA will get nothing but a blob of random noise. And then they'll start looking at you more. <laughs> yes. Well, then we should all do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I'm, a, I'm old enough to remember back in 1976, there was a bicentennial, and there was a big rally in Washington, and someone was circulating a petition about, I don't even remember what it was about now, but one of the organizers got up on stage and said, I understand some of you are concerned that if you sign this petition, you will have an FBI file. I just have one question. Why the hell don't you have an FBI file now? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm pretty sure I've had one for 40 years. <laughs> or what makes you think you don't? <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Uh, any idea how far we are from the quantum computer? Oh, they're, they're working on it now. Um, it's, it's devilishly difficult. Because what we're seeing is, yeah, we can do quantum computing and do calculations of, you know, we can factor three-digit numbers with a quantum computer that's cooled to, like, two degrees above absolute zero. And it's like, okay, there's some engineering in it. <laughs> the theory's there, but the engineering is, is going to take a while. Another piece of that, uh, recently a $600 million dollar a consortium was put together between MIT and a half five companies to work on that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. how, how you scale up something where you can do, you know, on the head of a pen into something you can use practically in, in manufacture. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part. So, uh, two-part two question. Do you use full system encryption? And if so, how do you implement that? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, yes, I do for some things. Um, I think the thing about full system encryption, I'm, I'm going to go back to the, the Bruce Schneier approach. What is the threat that you wish to guard against? All right. Um, if you regularly cross the border, you want, want to think about that. On the other hand, generally speaking, you can be legally compelled to decrypt when you cross the border, or they may not let you cross the border. So a lot of issues there. Uh, and you have to think about, uh, you know, is, is this the hill I want to die on? Uh, now, as to how to do it, if you're using Linux, you're probably still safe with TrueCrypt. Um, it has been forked. Uh, VeraCrypt is being actively developed. If you were on Windows, the TrueCrypt uh, driver, Windows driver, they ran into some problems there. 
So you could, could basically get a privilege escalation out of it. That's considered bad. Um, so, but you know, if you're not using Windows, and uh, you know, if you're using Windows and you're concerned about security, I have to question. <laughs> Yes? When I worked for the state of Michigan, I was required to use it. Um, I, you know, uh, you are trusting your security to encryption that you don't know anything about. And that's, if, if, you can't, if you can't look at the code, you don't know. Um, and we just saw that with uh, Volkswagen, you know. None of that would have happened if the code was open. So to me, the takeaway is open code makes us all safer. Okay, are we, I guess we're probably about done. Thanks, everyone.